to the bisexual agenda. Hi Kit, uh, it's great to finally be here since we've been talking about doing this for about a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just too busy because Capricorn life. So we're going to talk about gay films today, bisexual films, even though there's only like five on the whole planet. Yeah, uh, I mean, most of the films that I've picked to talk about aren't particularly bisexual because I was really struggling to think of any bisexual films. <laughs> yeah, the ones on my list mainly just have a threesome. Yeah, I think there's a there's a real problem with by representation in film in the sense that it's never explicit it's yeah. always either it's not mentioned at all it's just a character happens to have sex with or relationships with people of different genders but they never explicitly say that that's bisexual um like quite often it'll be like oh this person this character's been straight for three seasons and now suddenly they're gay. And there's it's like there's no in-between or there's no, you know, bisexuality doesn't really exist in the world of film and TV that I can see. Um, so, yeah, it's super, super unusual to get actual explicit bi-representation in, in films, I think. Yeah, I read this article that was about bi-representation in TV and it basically said what was missing was the character actually saying they're bi. And just the word bisexual. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Um, because, like, so often you can, you can watch a film that is, you know, even a queer film that is ostensibly about lesbians or ostensibly about gay men. Like, some of those characters could be bi, but you would never know it. And, the, you know, the same with a lot of, you know, uh, of, of kind of more mainstream stuff where... where it's just a bunch of straight people, and then suddenly one character comes out as gay. But they, it's like they can't be bi. It's like having bi people in film and TV will just confuse straight people. Yeah, also because I think a lot of the times, if the character is bisexual, everyone who finds out that they're bi will just be like, oh, that person's gay now, like, within the show. Like, with... um. What's her face on Orange is the New Black? Do you mean Piper? <laughs> yes, I was like, Tyler. <laughs> Piper doesn't... She says she's bisexual once and there's like eight seasons and her whole family are like, what the fuck, you're lesbian? And like everyone in the prison is like, oh, you're lesbian or you're straight. And she keeps saying, oh, I'm not lesbian. But she never says that she's bi. Yeah, it's it's... <sighs> It's really weird, and I, I mean, it is bi erasure, and this is like typical bi erasure. You know, it's it's the sort of bi erasure that exists in real life, where it's like you can't have both. You can't you can't be attracted to more than one gender. It's like you have to choose, and it's shitty, basically. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, I just think, like, you don't necessarily have to have them having a romantic relationship with like more than one gender for it to be bisexual but that's the only ones that I've like got on my list because then it's like they probably are bi then even if they didn't say but it's like it'd be good if it was a like gay seeming film but one of the characters was bi and said they were bi like they don't have to be like here's a man I used to fuck yeah it can just you know I think there's ways of expressing that a character is bi without them having to fuck everyone in sight you yeah. know, and, <laughs> and yeah, it would be super nice to just have a film where, you know, the, there was a character in a long term relationship with a person of whatever gender, but for them to explicitly be bi, but without them having to cheat on their partner or without their, you know, without them necessarily having to be polyamorous or anything like that. But like, let's just have them, you know, let's have characters who are, you know, proud and openly bi in our films and TV. And that is something we really, really don't have at the moment. Um, it, it's super difficult to find them. Um, yeah. Yeah, also, if no one in their life made it an issue that they were bi, because I feel like every time there's a bi character their parents aren't okay with it, their partner isn't okay with it, they end up breaking out because they've cheated on their partner, and it's just like, does it have to be a big drama to be bi? I mean, even in kind of queer 
shows, like, you know, the L word, the bi characters in that are not treated very well mm. by the other characters in the show. And, in you know, in fact, by the writers, it's almost like, oh, bisexual people, I'm not sure they should be welcomed into our lesbian club because they're bi and therefore they're, you know, they're somehow spoiling our kind of pure lesbian experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that is a real problem. And it get you know, that that kind of prejudice against bi people, it does exist in queer communities. And because it exists in queer communities, it, it then gets represented in the films and TV that are made about queer communities. But that is not good. That You know, that just perpetuates these stereotypes mm -hmm. uh, of bi people as essentially being duplicitous and untrustworthy. I'm very trustworthy. And so are you. Yeah, you are very trustworthy. <laughs> I wouldn't be on this podcast if I didn't think you were trustworthy. <laughs> do you have your list or do you want me to do my list first? Uh, well, maybe we could do one each, take it in turns. Okay, so, nice. Do you I've got, start? like, loads, so... Okay, I've got two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I made you watch Whip It the other day. Which yes, you did. I'm going to designate as a bisexual film, and I think no one can argue with that. I don't think anyone can. Like, it's just... There's this long history in cinema of queer coded films with no explicitly queer characters in it. I think Whip It is a prime example of that because every character in that is queer, yet none of them are explicitly queer. It is a super, super queer film. It, you know, it's about roller derby <laughs> for a start. Like, that is just like the, the epitome of queer sport. Um, and yeah, like every character is queer. And then, you know, they're not just like, I mean, I guess you can say that they're, they're all quite kind of stereotypical. And that's like, I don't want to say that in a negative way, like stereotypes are kind of essential to film because mm -hmm. you need to get an impression of what a character is visually very quickly. Um, but they're, they're not all the same. They're, you know, all those characters... I think I said this when we were watching it, it's like, I could go out into our community here and I could pick people who are like those characters. And it's like, that is a really awesome representation of what a queer community can be. Um, it's just a shame that it's not actually queer. Yeah, I feel like it is and it isn't. Essentially, when I watch it, I just imagine that Ellen Page and Arlia Shawkat are together. Because if they, like, added one extra scene, it could very much be one of them is in love with the other, and that's why their friendship falls apart when Ellen Page starts dating that wetbag guy. Oh, yeah, totally. You could, yeah, you could just add, you know, add in a couple of little scenes and it would make it queer. And also, I think the fact that, like, a lot of the cast are, uh, are actually queer. Like, yeah, Ellen like... Page is queer. <laughs> Stop making Ellen Page get with men. It's really not fun. Yeah. Ellen Page is lesbian. Alia Sharkat is um, bisexual. And Drew Barrymore, the director, is bisexual, which we've just confirmed. <laughs> yeah, we did a quick Google before, before we started this podcast, just any, to make sure. Any woman that I've ever had, like, a photograph of her on my wall, I'm like, she can't be straight, because why would I be drawn to her in this way? I don't know, I think it's totally possible to have crushes no! on straight women. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so with it, we love it. Watch it if you like roller derby or good music. I like the soundtrack. Or just watch it if you like Alan Page, basically. Yeah. If you like Alan Page... Andrew Barrymore. You'll fucking love it. Um, Black Swan was, like, the first gay-ish film I ever saw, I think. And it fucking terrified me. I had my eyes shut for, like, the entire movie, apart from the sex scene, and I was like, love it! <laughs> have you it seen didn't, it? I have seen it. It didn't scare me. I kind of laughed. I didn't find it scary because I didn't find it realistic. So I was laughing at the scary parts. Oh, shit. I just because I'm weird like that. The reason I found it so scary is because my friends were just like, oh, do you want to go see this movie? And I was like, oh yeah, Natalie Portman Ballet. Like, sounds quite chill. And then we got there and I realised it was a horror movie and I was just like, oh, fuck me. Like, now I'm trapped in the cinema and I'm terrified. But I mean, she basically has sex with herself in that film. Because... They're the same person. 
No, they're not. They are the same person. No, but she has sex with... um. Mia, Mia, Mila Kunis. Yeah. Yeah, but they're the same person. No, they're not. Yeah, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. <laughs> Oh shit. Okay, maybe I, maybe I completely misunderstood that bill. That's the way I took it. That, that, I wasn't. Like, yeah, that at the end, uh, it's revealed they're basically the same person and she's playing both roles in the in the bar. Ugh, okay. Maybe I just had my eyes closed for too much in the film. Okay, what's on your list? Um, so the first one on my list is All About Them, which is a French slash Belgian film from 2014 or 2015. Um, it is basically the classic French menage a trois comedy, basically. Um, but, I mean, I kind of have to spoil the ending to, to you know, convey that it is it is by representation, and it's, it's also a polyamorous representation. Um, it's about two girls and a guy... Effectively, they're all having relationships with each other, and then they all find out that they're having relationships with each other. But it does have a happy ending, um, and yeah, it's a really, it's kind of like a laugh out loud comedy. It's very bougie, like it's not like <laughs> it kind of appeals to me because anything anything that's French is just super hot because anyone speaking French is hot. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's really bougie, and I'm just obsessed with French cinema. So yeah, that's why I like it. Like, it's not like your kind of super grassroots queer kind of film, but I do think it has pretty positive bi representation in it. It's not, you know, there's there isn't any kind of biphobia in there. It's just three people who happen to all like each other, and. They fall in love and effectively live happily ever after. Wow. So, you know, I think that's super positive. Because um, I like I spent a long time thinking about what films I could discuss here. And I like it's really, really hard to find films that have good bi representation. So I program for um, Leeds Queer Film Festival and even there, where we're looking at really independent queer films, we really struggle to find bi films. Even you know, we we struggle to find kind of trans films, and like I'm I'm kind of always on the lookout for good trans films because I am trans, and I would say I I find it easier to find good trans films and good trans representation in films than I do to find good bi representation in films, and that is kind of saying something um, I think about how how. Um, lacking good bi representation is, um, but yeah, all about them. Like it's not, it's not some kind of super amazing, wonderful, um, you know, cinematic feast. But it is just <laughs> this kind of quite light hearted rom com. Basically, it's it's a thruple rom com. I yes. think is the best way to describe it. Um, and I. I, I I'd actually did a talk a few weeks ago um, about the L word, and what I was saying in, is that the L word is essentially trash, but it's good trash. <laughs> and I think there's something to be said about having trash. We deserve trash too. Yeah, we do deserve trash too. And like, I actually always remember like um, something my mum used to say is that when you're talking about culture so it might be film tv theater books whatever she was like you always need some roughage in your diet <laughs> and it's like yes we need roughage too we need queer <laughs> roughage and so it's okay to have these like really light-hearted uh, trashy things that yes and sometimes they're quite pro- they can be quite problematic but it's still okay to love them and i think kind of all about them Although it's kind of like this obscure French film, so like I am being a bit of a kind of film <laughs> snob by picking it. Um, it is, a, you know, just this really light-hearted thing, and yeah, you should try and check it out if you can find it. I feel like that fits perfectly because my next one is Heartbeats by Xavier Dolan, which is basically exactly the film you just said, but it doesn't have a happy ending and no one gets laid. 
<laughs> it's basically like these two friends, a girl and a guy, both fall in love with the same guy and they're trying to work out if he's like gay or straight or bi and they're both madly in love with him. And then they go stay at a house all together. Um, and they like end up sleeping in the same bed together, but nothing happens. And then the girl gets incredibly jealous of the guy and they end up having this like fight. And in the end, neither of them get the guy, but it's just like the perfect queer angst French film. And it has amazing music. So I like, I, I'm, I've got a confession to make, which is that I've never seen a Xavier Dolan film. <sighs> um, although I probably should have. Yeah, I, he doesn't appeal to me. Really? I think we should watch that one together because I think you would really like it. I think I probably would really like it and then I'd probably hate myself for liking it. <laughs> Why? What's, has he done something terrible? Uh, he did, he has made, he made a... I don't know whether I've not I don't I don't want to say too much about it, but he did make a trans film where a cis man played a trans character, which I don't like. Okay, yeah, that's shit. I didn't see that one because like all the reviews were negative, so I didn't see that one. i I think I've only seen two of his films, but Heartbeats is my favourite one, but I haven't seen it for like four years. But it's just like very beautiful. It has great colours. Yeah, he's he's a bit of a And a lot of dramatic slow mo. It's like you know, like the gay guy in your art class who was really good but really pretentious. Yeah, that's kind of how I imagine his films to be. Um, I think that's why he's a real darling of like film festivals because, <laughs> you know, he's this very kind of pretentious arty director that they like. Yeah. Um, Have you seen the thing where Mads Mikkelsen is like pulling a face where he got some award? He's like, I fucking hate that guy. I've not seen that. I'll but... show it to you. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think part of the fact was that he became this darling of French cinema when he was 19, because he made his first film he when he was 19. He doesn't overachieve it. I wonder what his star sign is. Fuck, okay, I'm going to try and Google it. And then my next one is Kissing Jessica Stein, which is the bisexual rom-com that we all needed. It's, like, from the same era as, like, When Harry Met Sally and all those, like, really sexist rom-coms. But it's so wholesome. Like, it's my favourite film to watch when I'm when I'm sick. And it basically has this woman who's been single for a while and she's putting, like, lonely hearts ads in the newspaper and all the men are trash. And then she reads an ad where she's like, oh my god, this person would be perfect for me. But then she realises it's from a woman. And she's like, mm, why not? I'll just go on a date. So they go on a date and she, like, freaks out because she's like, I'm so sorry, I'm not a lesbian. Um, but then they end up falling in love, and it's really sweet, and just like classic rom com. But then it's annoying because in the end, the girl she dates ends up in like a lesbian deathbed relationship where they don't fuck, um, and then the original woman gets back with her ex, who's just like a boring straight man who works at her newspaper with her. That's sad. Yeah, but if you just didn't watch the end, it would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> And it's still really sweet. Because I agree, like, I think we need trash. And we're, like, missing out. Like, there's only one gay film for every, like, a thousand straight films. So we, like, need to catch up on all the trash. So I don't particularly mind if it kind of sucks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on the idea of, like, a queer soap opera... Mm -hmm. Just because our lives are so dramatic anyway, like... No one needs to die for it to be, like, dramatic and hard-hitting. Yeah, like, queer soap. Like, let's have a queer soap. Um, appropriate behaviour. Do you want to talk about how, why you hated the bisexual? Because I really like... Her film, and we really both didn't like the TV show. So first of all, I've not seen Appropriate Behaviour, although I would really like to. So it... I can like give you a synopsis. It's basically she's bi and she's just broken up with her lesbian ex girlfriend, and they were together for a really long time. And she's not out to her family because of like cultural reasons, but she starts dating again. But it's basically just a breakup movie. Like, she bumps into her ex on this night out where they're both with other people and it's just big bisexual angst. 
I mean, it sounds like the plot of the bisexual. <laughs> it is, the thing is, is what she did with the bisexual, but it makes so much sense because it's a film. Yeah. And it has it has a similar mood, but it, the funny bits are actually funny and the sad bits aren't as sad. Whereas I feel like the bi- bisexual is like trying to be like emotional, but also funny, but the funny bits aren't funny enough and the sad bits are too sad. Yeah, I get it. And I mean. felt like they had too many storylines happening that just too much happened every episode and I feel like you didn't really get to know any of the characters, even her. Like, for the bisexual, what I liked, I... Or what The the way I empathised with her character was as, you know, she's a queer character and she is surrounded by all these kind of arty hipster types in London and as someone who spent a few years in London working in the film industry, that was my experience of being mm-hmm. queer, where, yes, there are other queer people in that environment, but it's not a queer community. And so I really liked, the, or the bits that I liked about the bisexual was this, like, when you're a queer person, but you're not in a queer community, or not an, ex- or not an exclusively queer community, or majority queer community... Mm-hmm. Um, what I didn't like was all the straight <laughs> characters. Like, why? I, d- I don't need straight characters in queer film and TV. Like, I there are thousands of films and TV shows that I can go watch to get my fix of straight people. And yeah, the straight guy who she lived with was completely unnecessary and incredibly annoying. Well, Andy just, you know, his he, his plot took up so much screen time. I was convinced that they were going to reveal that he was bi at some point, and then they never did. And it was just like, why? I don't want straight characters in my queer TV, because we don't get enough queer representation. So I don't. when we do get it, I don't want... It to be filled with straight people. Yeah, and it wasn't even just like, oh, they have a couple of queer characters. Like, he was the second main character, and he was a cunt. Yeah, it's like, just don't do it. Don't put straight people... uh, Well, I'm not going to say don't put straight people in your queer films, but don't have them as main characters. Yeah, and also, I don't... Like, if you're going to make a TV show called The Bisexual, a lot of straight people won't watch it. So you don't need to put a straight guy in it as a lead role to make it more relatable for them. No, like, you don't need straight people in your queer films. That's, <laughs> that's my, that's, that, is, that is my literal rule. And it's, you know, so many, so many of the films and TV shows that I can think of with queer representation, it's like, there's one queer character, and that's it. That's the queer representation. And that doesn't ring true to real life. Like, I, I, I do know that a lot of queer people can be quite isolated, and you know, unless you, you, know, you can find a, a queer community in your local area. But queer people tend to always be on the lookout for other queer people. That's how we form relationships. Not just sexual relationships, but friendships. And, you know, if you're a queer person, you 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 are you are going to know other queer people more than likely, and so when you have these, you know, particularly shows that are set in in big cities like London or New York, how is it possibly realistic that there's a queer character who just hangs around with straight people? <laughs> that is not realistic they hate at themselves. all. <laughs> yeah, maybe like that one queer character has a whole secret other life with all their queer friends, and whenever they're hanging out with the straight people, they're like, oh, not again. (laughs) So my other film, uh, this is one that we showed at Leeds Queer Film Festival. Yay! Um, It's not explicitly bi, as I remember, but it is super, super queer, and super, super amazing. Um, It'll probably... I, I wanted to recommend it, because it's probably actually really hard for anyone to find... Um, but if you can find it, I think it's really amazing. And I always like to promote genuinely independent queer films. Uh, so it's called Whisper of the Jaguar. Um, and it is a Brazilian slash Colombian slash German production. Um, I think it was made a couple of years ago. So 2017, 2018. And... Essentially, it is, it is made by two queer people, one cis woman and one, I believe she's a trans woman, but 
it, her gender is in the in the film is very ambiguous. Uh, she, uh, she she plays a kind of gender fluid character, um, and they they co-directed and they both co-star in the film, and it is basically this incredible kind of journey up the Amazon River. Um, explores kind of contemporary Brazilian politics, environmental politics, colonialism, post-colonialism, like, oh, it looks super <laughs> cinematic and it's super queer and it's got these, like, amazing kind of p- queer performance art sequences in it and it's got this great soundtrack and it looks amazing and, yeah, if you can find it, please watch it. It, it, it is... These are the sorts of films that I like to recommend because they don't get big releases. You, you know, you ha- you probably do have to find them at festivals. You might be able to find it online. I don't know. Um, and the these films deserve to be seen by much, much wider audiences. And I think there's something about film has become much more accessible over the last 10 years because of uh, the development of digital cameras that, you know, people... You know, although it's not super cheap, it's it's no longer super expensive either to make a film and make a film that looks really, really good. And I think that, you know, these are the sorts of films that benefit from that and, and they really, really deserve to be seen because this is the sort of representation we, we don't get. And particularly, you know, you're talking about queer people of colour here, trans people of colour. Um, th- this They don't get that representation in mainstream film and TV. And that is kind of why I wanted to recommend it. Beautiful. So now we're gonna talk about the dream gay film that we would make if we had unlimited budget and power, ultimately. I mean, I, I'm I'm working towards getting unlimited budget and power. That's, <laughs> that's my goal in life. It's it's my queer goal is to is to you know become like the the queer Hollywood producer that I dream about, basically. <laughs> yes. Are you going first? I can go first on this one. Do it. Then I'll know if I need to make mine better. So I haven't really come up with a plot. Um, I it's more a kind of based on what I think is missing from a lot of the queer films that I see and a lot of the queer representation in mainstream films that I see. And it is basically, if I wanted to make a bi film or a queer film, I it would be filled with queer people. It would be set in a queer community. There would be no straight people in it. It would be queer people hanging out with queer people. So every character would be queer. There would be bi people. There would be trans people. Um, that's the representation that I want to see. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I haven't picked a plot because whatever happens, whatever happens great. happens. There's you know, there's so many stories that can be told from within our communities because we are super super diverse. We have so many different interests, and you know so many wonderful lives to tell. Like I, you know, I know hundreds of queer people in my local community and I, I consider myself to be super fortunate that I do and having that kind of queer family both close friends and then like an extended kind of friendship community network has saved my life oh god Olivia like, don't make me cry <laughs> it is super super important and so that is what I would want to make a film about that because that is my life and that is that is for me the ideal queer experience. Mm-hmm. Tell me um, the cast. So my cast, I have one, I have one, two, three, four, five. I have five people, and then I have a cinematographer as well. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, so my cast is. Um, how shall I start? Who shall I start with? Um, I'm going to go with uh, Jean Jean Seberg, um, who starred in Breathless back in the 1960s, <gasps> just because she looks super queer. I oh mean, I don't God. know whether she was queer. Is she um, alive? Or are you, no, are you meaning um, like back in no, time? No, back in time, she 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 sadly committed suicide. Oh fuck! Um, 
uh, I think she committed suicide sometime in the 1970s. Okay, so this is a un- this is just a fantasy. This is casting. yeah, this is very much a fantasy casting. Mine's a um, real life casting. I'm I'm obsessed with 1960s French cinema, so that is why She's Jean Seberg gorgeous. is in she, my film. She could do Baby Butch or High Femme. Like she, anything. She's she's my super baby butch character. Um, I want her in my film in a New York Herald Tribune t shirt. Um yes. just because <gasps> she looks super queer in it. She's um, gorgeous. Yeah, she's perfect. Um so my second uh, cast member is also from nineteen sixties French cinema. Um uh, probably more of a femme character. Uh, she is Anna Karina. Um, Beautiful. French Danish uh, actress. Starred in loads and loads of films in the 60s. And I, I believe she's still alive. Do you think we could just cut two, both those films together and make it lesbian? Oh, sure, yeah. No problem. I feel like we could do that. Yeah, definitely. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> like, I, I don't think they ever starred together. Um, but they probably should have done. Um, and uh, so my next actress is another French actress. <laughs> like you might, you might be able to tell where my interests lie by Olivia this point. Olivia has a French fetish. <laughs> oh, also, watch Call My Agent. So this actress does have a Call My Agent link. So she okay. was, she's been in a, a couple of episodes of Call My. It is the redhead Aud- <laughs> Audrey Fleuro. Um, I am. Um, I am obsessed <laughs> with Audrey Fleuro. She. I originally saw her in a French series called Spiral, which is a cop show, where she plays a lawyer, uh, a lawyer who defends like dodgy criminals, basically. Um, She's so hot. Um, she also has been a guest actress in a show called Call My Agent, which is on Netflix, which is a comedy set in uh, an agency, an, an, an actor's agency, which has some queer characters in it. So it's probably something you should definitely check out. It's really funny. And, you know, particularly if you're interested in film, it's a, it's a really good send up of the film industry. Um, and it's filled with hot French actors and actresses. So, you know... That is right up my street, as you probably <laughs> figured out right now. Um, so, yes, yeah, she would be my third uh, cast member. Um, now we can move away from, from the French actresses. Um, I don't think anyone has a problem with that. I think you could make it French. There's so many, like, bougie gays who love French cinema. Yeah, I mean, I, it could be French. I mean, my, my next two next two characters are American, but, it, you know, it, it could be French. Could be French American, I don't mind. Um, so my next uh, actress is India Moore, um, a trans actress. Uh, they star in Pose. I mean, if you're not watching Pose, you should be. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to get on. Um, <laughs> we haven't even fucking finished the series. <laughs> well. We are watching it, though. Yeah. Um, we're, in the pros we're not up to date with Pose, but we are watching it. <laughs> um, it is the best trans representation on TV ever. Genuinely amazing show filled with trans characters, queer characters, amazing trans people of colour. Costuming. Trans writers, queer writers, great music. Like, seriously, if you're not watching it, you, look, you just can't be my friend, okay? <laughs> um, my final cast member, I've gone for a non-actor, but I figure it's okay to just Is it have... a celebrity cameo? It's a celebrity cameo. Yeah, every film needs one. Um, they are a TV personality, so I figured... I figured that... I think they would... I think uh, this person would be a really good actor. Um, so my final cast member is Jonathan Van Ness from <gasps> Queer Eye. <laughs> yes! Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Mainly just because for all those tall girls out there, he is a super style icon. Um, I'm obsessed with the yellow coat that he wore for about two seconds in one of the Queer Eye episodes in the latest Episode season. Episode two, season four. If anyone can find the yellow coat, tell us. We've like searched on Reddit. People are trying to find it. No one knows. It's like calf length, boxy, yellow wool coat with a single button. I mean, honestly, I think that, you know, that yellow coat, it's, it's, 
it's like I medically need it as part of my transition. <laughs> it should be available on the NHS. Um, <laughs> it is gorgeous. And pretty much anything Jonathan wears is gorgeous. And I just want to go and raid his closet. Um, so that's why I want him to star in my film. So <laughs> that he off. can be occupied while I go and raid his closet. Um, yes. <laughs> that's completely legitimate. And what kind of role is he going to be starring in? Like, what's his character? Or is he just being himself? He can just basically be himself. Like, I feel like he he's one of the... He, he would be, you know, he would he would be one of those actors where, he you know, every film he, he actually just needs to play himself. That's, yeah. And he would just give an amazing performance every time. Um, yes, Jonathan Van Ness would be in my film. Uh, and my final one, I picked a cinematographer because why not? Um, I'm a, I'm I'm a, a filmmaker as well, so I thought I'd pick some I'd pick a crew member. Um, so my cinematographer is primarily a stills photographer, but I figure she could also turn her hand to cinematography. Um, so it's Cindy Sherman, because um, like I was screaming about Cindy Sherman on my Instagram today. She's the queerest straight photographer that I I've, know. Like, do we have confirmation that she's straight? Because I really... Sh she can't be. She's queer in essence, even if she's not in practice. All her work is queer. Like, yeah. her work is... Her work is basically drag. and It's drag. And also, like, she started doing it when she was really young. She hated being, like scene which is the queer experience yeah. she hated being visible as a woman so she decided that she would dress up into a different character every day like before so i was obsessed with cindy sherman, cindy sherman when i was a student and Same. um i wasn't out as trans at this point and i just loved this idea that like she in her self portraits she never wanted to be seen as herself because and I think she's spoken about feeling uncomfortable as herself. Mm -hmm. And that was just super resonant for me. So, like, I actually did a whole photography project, which basically ripped her <laughs> off. Um, so I did a whole load of self-portraits that were essentially rip-offs of Cindy Sherman <laughs> for I, a university project. Uh, I did exactly the same thing, but in sixth form. Everyone's done it. Yeah. Like, I, I think film, the black and white film stills of her in the, like, slip, that is my artistic goal. You know, I think imitation is the highest form of flattery, and yeah, I her imitated whole, Cindy Sherman. Her whole thing is about imitation, so I don't think she would ever be annoyed that all the queer babies are copying her. Yeah, like, definitely. Um, you know, it's not like I went on to sell my photographs for millions of pounds, so I don't think it really <laughs> matters. Um, I think that's a great idea. I feel like she'd be up for it. Yeah, I think, like, I don't know whether she's done any kind of video work, um, I, I haven't seen any. Yeah, I I only re obviously she's known for her photographs. Um, I know she's done some um, kind of sculptural work where she make she kind of makes a, a sculpture and then photographs it as well. Um, I don't know whether she's done any video work. It seems kind of weird that she hasn't. It is um, weird because like she references films so much and her yeah. photos are so cinematic. But maybe that's the point. Yeah. Even if she wasn't happy doing the filming, we could get her to do a series of photos of all the characters. Yeah, she could just be like the behind the scenes stills photographer. Yeah, we, we basically we just want Cindy Sherman on set. Sure, okay, your film would definitely be better than mine. Yours would be very classy. I'm I'm a classy queer. Like it's <laughs> it's really weird because like I'm I'm probably not, but I am. Like, there's this tension between... You've got your bougie side. Th there's a massive tension between my bougie side and my working-class Yorkshire woman side, um, which I kind of like. I like being bougie every now and then. I think everyone deserves to be bougie. I'm I'm all for fully automated luxury... Cap ca uh, <laughs> fully automated luxury communism. Uh, I nearly said capitalism, and I was like, no, I'm not for capitalism. <laughs> you know, like, stop! <laughs> Yeah, when we hate capitalism here, guys, if it hasn't been made clear yet, <laughs> we hate it. We hate capitalism, but please tell me where I can buy that yellow coat that Jonathan Van Ness wore. Um, I don't really want to pay for it if it's like £3,000, but like... We could just... do a Kickstarter yeah. if it's expensive. Okay, 
I'm gonna do my one now and it's not as good as Olivia's, but it's the Devil Wears Prada, but gay. And it's gonna be called the Dyke Wears Prada. Nice. Yes. I, I feel like yours is as bougie as mine, like. Okay. <laughs> the Dyke Wears Prada, that is very bougie. <laughs> Let me talk you through it. So, Angelina Jolie and Kate Blanchett are the two lead roles. So, Angelina Jolie has been the head of a magazine for a while and people are starting to question whether she's, you know, behind the times. They're thinking, is it time for her to go? Her hair's a bit of a mess. She's not current anymore. And then Kate Blanchett arrives from Australia. She's going to be Australian in this film because I feel like people are always making her not Australian. And I want her to be Australian for once. So she starts up a new magazine and they become business rivals who then fall in love and become an iconic power suit power couple wow (laughs) (laughs) yeah and so i've got everyone else as well so i've got this is where whip it becomes part of the film so alia (laughs) shaka is kate's new intern and she's really bad at her job but her girlfriend ellen page who is a chef is really supportive and she actually cooks her good meals not just like a toasty like the boyfriend in devil wears prada and Basically, the rivalry between Kate and Angelina is that they're both competing to get Lupita Nyong'o on the cover of the magazine for the September issue. Wow. Maybe one of them could seduce her. I feel like that could be part of it as well. We're having... I feel like your film is just going to be, like, dyke drama. It's dyke drama, but ultimately wholesome. Nice. Like, they're in love. Maybe, like, half... They don't get together at the end. They get together halfway through, you know? And then it just becomes, like power bitches and i'm gonna have amanda is it stanberg she's gonna be the emily blunt character so she's like the bitchy intern who helps her become good at her job nice yeah and stanley tucci's gonna be in it still he's of course he's my one man (laughs) stanley tucci's amazing (laughs) yes and i thought like is stanley tucci queer he fucking must be right i would like him to be queer i think he's gay Unless my whole life is just a lie. Uh, the third result is wife. <laughs> Shit. We all know all Hollywood actors and actresses are actually queer, but they just have these straight relationships just as a pretense and a cover. <sighs> okay, fuck. It doesn't seem like he is, but... Shit. Okay, well, I'm still casting him. Yeah, it's fine. Once Maybe he, he's closeted. You know, that's completely... once he's been in this film, he can be queer. He'll he'll realize. Yeah, it's it's okay for him to come out as queer at any age. Yeah, exactly. And it would just be great press for my film as well as he dramatically came out as bisexual just before the release. Definitely. Yeah, and it's gonna be amazing. And yeah. Rihanna's gonna be in it as well somehow. She could be a makeup artist for the magazines when they become the power couple. And she can like sing the theme tune. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to pick Robin to, like, do a theme for mine. But she's not French. I feel like you need a gay French theme tune. Nah. I, I mean, I'm sure Robin could, like, sing in French. Yeah. She's, like, very powerful. I feel like she could do anything. <laughs> Okay, what's your bisexual agenda? So my bisexual agenda, I've got three things on it. My first one is queer family, uh, which I spoke about earlier. My queer family, my queer community has been super important in my life. Queer families can be filled with drama and, and, you know, that can be super bad. But also, you know, all families are filled with drama and ultimately families are things that you rely on and, and you forgive each other and... You know, not having a queer family would have made my life a lot more difficult. Coming out as trans, I needed to be in a, a, an environment where um, there were other trans people from a variety of different backgrounds and, and a variety of different, you know, genders and gender, gender expressions. Because I feel like that if you don't have that, you just have this very stereotypical image of what it is to be queer what it is to be trans and 
being in a being in a genuine like queer community it it gives you so many more options to be who who you are mm -hmm. and to see that and ultimately you are, you are, you end up all lifting each other up and i know like i i kind of move between a job where i'm in a very kind of cis het environment and then a social life and, and a community life where I'm surrounded by queer people, all sorts of different queer people. And the difference moving between those two environments is, is so stark. And if I didn't have that, I, my life would be a lot, lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a super positive experience to have, have a big queer family around you or a queer community around you. And, you know, if, if you're a queer person that doesn't have that, try and find it do whatever you can to try and find it and it doesn't have to be in real life because for ages i had like a queer community online and not in real life i i like i, I do agree with that to a certain extent but i think it, it like there is something about having it in real life that is way more powerful than having it online like yes online communities are super important in terms of helping people to come out and and you know, particularly, particularly like young people who might be, you know, trapped in in an environment that they can't easily escape mm -hmm. if they've got unsupported parents and things like that. And yeah, that was important for me as trans, and I, I certainly know it's important for a lot of trans people. But the, you know that there is something super affirming about being able to go out to queer events. I live in a city that has a queer bar, and I don't mean a gay bar. <laughs> I mean a queer bar. Yeah, it has a. Uh, there's a queer performance um, space. There's a queer coffee shop. There's, you know, I'm part of a of the organising group for a queer film festival. We have a trans pride. These things and you know, meeting other queer people, having queer people as friends, it is so important. It's just essential and a lot of queer spaces are closing down in big cities because of gentrification and that means that queer communities are being broken apart and it's it, you know it's something that we, we we absolutely need to fight against and and because you know having those communities the you know real life communities that are offline are you know it, it it's super super affirming it makes you feel so powerful as a queer person very beautiful um, so my second, my second by agenda, like, I, I don't actually mean it like this. I wrote activist burnout, but I obviously like my <laughs> by agenda is not activist burnout. It's I'm against activist burnout. Um, I guess like having been an activist, um, in particularly for trans people in, in the local community, um, activist burnout is huge. Um, it's something that I've experienced pretty much every trans person I know who's been involved in activism has burnt out and it, it happens really quickly. It's like there's a cycle that goes round. I think we just need to be a lot better at supporting the people in our communities who are doing this work. Um, you know, that, you know, they're working for the most marginalized people. They're working for, for trans people. They're working for, you know, migrants and asylum seekers. They're working with queer prisoners they're working with sex workers. They're, they're usually doing it for no money or very little money because there's, at least in the UK, there, there, there is very, very little money available to do this work. It's just not valued monetarily by society um, for various horrible reasons. And so I, I think it's super important to support the activists in your community. Um, yeah. With money and with love. With money and with love, yeah. Like, support them with money. And, you know, I think having been an activist, like, it's super easy to think, like, when you do get money, because there is, you have so many priorities to spend it on... It's gone. It goes straight away. And, and the activists that I, I've worked with have all been so committed that they would never think to spend it on themselves. Um, but I, I do think there is something to be said about, like give give you like treat your local activists to a meal out somewhere go take them for pizza you know give them that support 
beyond just don't just help them to do their work and then end up end up end up having them burn out like actually just look after them um that's that's actually what they need and my third by agenda is sex positive trans women and i was speaking with a friend about this uh, a couple of weeks ago and what we kind of realized is that over the last kind of maybe five six years Obviously, there's been an explosion in kind of trans visibility and trans representation. But one of the things we found super good about it was that trans women specifically um, and and femmes as well um, are being sex positive. It's okay for a trans woman to be a sexual being within her own right. And obviously, the you know, trans women are super demonized for wanting sex um, you know, we're, we're seen as a threat, we're seen as dangerous, uh, or, or we're just objectified and fetishized. fetishized. Um, but I, and I think there's, you know, there is now a huge amount of trans women who are saying, no, I'm, I, I like sex. It should be okay for a trans woman to like sex. And I think that, you know, this has been a problem within queer communities where, you know, trans women have been excluded from queer communities and then, you know, are not seen as if effectively, you know, desirable partners. And I think that is changing and that is changing because trans women are kind of standing up and saying, actually, yeah, we're sexual beings and we're allowed to enjoy sex and we're allowed to enjoy sex in different ways to people of other genders. Um, and, and that is... A, you know, it is a super transformative experience that, that and, and, and kind of conversation that's been going on in in trans and queer communities over the last few years. And it's it's a long process because, you know, unfortunately trans you know, fighting for trans rights is is a long process and has been a long process and is absolutely nowhere near um, uh, complete. But th- those conversations are happening, you know, People like Juno Rush and Kate Bornstein and people like that. Um, it, it is super valuable as that as a trans woman to to know that those experiences are allowed to be talked about, um, and you know, we're, yeah, we're, that that we're allowed to be sexual and we're allowed to be fun, have fun with sex, because that is what everyone should have. Agreed. Yay! Everyone should get laid and have fun doing it. Yeah, everyone should get laid. I, I say this as if they the, want as, to. Yes, obviously everyone should get laid if they want to. I say this as the most hopelessly single bi trans woman in existence. Um, but yes, everyone should get laid. Don't worry, we're gonna do a whole other episode where I just set you up. Yeah, there's gonna be a whole other episode of this podcast where we talk about my hopelessly single life. Um, but yes, that's for another time. Yes. Also, if you've listened to this podcast and you want to date Olivia, hit her up. Respectfully. (laughs) (laughs) And don't be an asshole. And you need to understand that she's very busy. Yeah, like, I I have had a few assholes hit me up. Like, it's weird, like, when I go out with my straight friends, I get hit on a lot by men, straight men, in straight bars. And it's not nice. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one straight man that you want. Yeah, there's one straight man that I want, <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll save that for another time. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for coming. Thank you, it's been wonderful. Love you forever. Love you too. Bye.